All right. Let's stop sharing my screen. And I wanted to welcome everybody who's joined us today for Weather Lore. Um, we're excited to have you here with us today. And in a moment, I will introduce you to our educator, Mark Breen, whose voice you may recognize. Um, my name is Drew Bush, and I'm the director of programs at the Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium. And I know some of you are going to be joining us in Zoom. Some of you have already joined us on YouTube Live. And I just wanted to point out how you can interact with Mark today for our class. Um, so if you're in Zoom, you can mouse your cursor down to the bottom of the screen, and you'll actually be able to see that there is a Q&A button that you can press on there. Um, you can write questions to Mark and to myself. We'll try to answer them live in the session. Um, if we get a lot of questions, we may answer a few of them via written format. We can write back to you on there. Please note, you, if you're afraid to uh, share your identity, you can also pose questions in the Q&A anonymously. Just to the right of that button, at the bottom of your screen, you can also see a chat button. On there, you can definitely chat with us um, anytime you want. In fact, today's class, Mark's Mark tells me, will be pretty interactive. He's going to pose some questions to you, and we ask you to use the chat to answer him. Um, the other way that you can interact with us is if you raise your hand. So you'll see a button at the bottom of your screen that also allows you to raise your hand, and I'll get pinged. And that's a way that I can share your video and your audio in today's session. And then you can talk live with Mark as well. Um, so just note, if you do choose that option, today's session is video recorded and it will be posted on our website and aired by Kingdom Access Television. So please don't you know, share your video if that's something that might concern you. And then for those of you who are on YouTube live, you'll notice that there's a chat screen on the upper right hand side of your screen where you can also pose questions and I'll be fielding those questions and making sure Mark has a chance to answer them too. And of course, if you're on YouTube and Mark is asking questions of you, you can use that chat to provide your answers also, and I'll represent them for Mark. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. And now I'd like to turn things over to Mark Breen, our educator. Right, great, thanks. Um, so this morning, um, I thought we'd basically you know, kind of keep an eye on what you can go outside and see. In fact, you should go outside and see. Um, I, I'm still. It, are, are we okay, Drew? I, I'm still seeing your image on on the screen. Is Mark, that... you you might need to just refresh your connection. I think you're having. It's a little bit glitchy right now. Okay, hang on. So you could you could try just turning off your camera for a second at the bottom left of your Zoom screen, and then okay, bring it back on if you want. Let's do that. Did that make any difference? Uh, we're just waiting for you to turn your camera back on. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, and uh, let's see here. I'm still not seeing, I thought I had an option to share my screen or not, let's see. Oops. Let's do that. And okay. Let's do that. Okay, so weather wisdom or weather lore. Uh, so one of the first things that you know comes to mind, maybe you could uh, share if you know any old weather say, something that a little phrase, something that may rhyme, that tells you what the weather is going to do. Um, so maybe you could enter those on the on the chat to see uh, see what we get for for things that you might have heard of before.
Okay, well, um, so one of the things that you might have heard before would be, and let me see if I can get that to, to show up here. Red at night, sailors delight. Red in the morning, sailors take warning. The oh. idea here being that if you can see a, a colorful sunset, it's going to be a nice day the next day. But if it's red in the morning, you see a colorful sunrise, then there's a storm coming up. So I saw your hand come up, Drew. Is there a question? Or? Oh, actually, just somebody trying to answer it. They're saying, one saying they've heard is it's raining cats and dogs. We also had one on the YouTube chat that weather is what you get and climate is what you expect. <laughs> so those are uh, okay. two our, our audience is suggesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, a little later on, we have some cat and dog weather sayings that we can talk about. Um, another one that people may have heard before, if all the cows are lying down, it's going to rain. Now, I don't know how many folks uh, have some cows of their own, perhaps, um, or you live next to a farm, or maybe you can see this. Obviously, uh, not as effective during this time of year when the cows are in the barn a lot of the time. But the idea is that uh, certainly during the summer, something that you can watch for. And then another one that I think people have heard before, because it's almost always on the news every year on February 2nd, if the groundhog sees a shadow, there'll be six more weeks of winter. So I picked those three in particular because one, I think many people have heard of them before, um, but they also, they kind of represent some different things that are part of weather lore, old weather sayings. So for example, red at night sailors delight, obviously comes from sailors. And if the cows are laying down, it's going to rain, that comes from farmers. Well, it turns out that a majority of the weather sayings often refer to farming, fishing, and sailing. And that's not because those were the only people paying attention to the weather. That's because, oh, if you go back about 150 years ago, 90% of the world's population, that's right, 90% were farmers, fishermen, or sailing, or they were connected to that. And so basically everybody was watching the weather because everybody's life was affected by it. And so that's one of the reasons that some of them seem to be, you know, so concentrated in farming and sailing and so forth. Uh, now the groundhog's a little different. Um, he's a kind of an example of a couple of things. Um, one, the idea of the groundhog seeing his shadow actually is not the original saying. And six more weeks of winter might obviously depend on where you are. So we'll get more into the groundhog in just a minute. In the meantime, this take a look at more detail in terms of the red at night, sailor's delight. So this colorful red, where do you suppose that comes from? Uh, maybe, you, again, if you could uh, maybe enter in the chat, uh, do you know why the sunset is red? Any ideas about that, where that red might come from? We'll just give you a minute to enter anything in the chat window. On um, we'll put it YouTube. in the chat window. Yep, or on YouTube, you can also enter on that chat, chat window if you guys are on there. Okay, well, maybe some of you know, or here's a good reminder. Um, first of all, know ye when the sky is red at night, the next day ye shall have fair weather. This is a very, very old weather saying. It's, it was written at least 2,000 years ago. In fact, in this part of the Bible, it was talked about as an old weather saying 2,000 years ago. But the red comes from the rainbow. Of course, you're familiar with rainbows, but that's because the sunlight, as it goes through the raindrop, actually breaks into the different colors of what we call the spectrum. And it turns out that colors like the purples and blues and greens they actually are bounced out of the atmosphere pretty easily, leaving oranges and reds. And that's especially true when there is dust in the atmosphere. So the idea of having dust in the atmosphere actually gives us a clue. If there is dust in the atmosphere, and I'm not talking about, well, here's a picture.
picture of the volcano exploding down on the bottom. And volcanic ash definitely can create some of this, but this is normal everyday dust. And as the sunlight tries to get through that, the greens and the blues and the purples, they all get bounced back out. But oranges and reds actually get through that. So it indicates there's dust in the atmosphere. Well, if there's dust in the atmosphere, it isn't raining. So that's one clue. The other clue is if you are seeing the sun and at sunset you're looking to the west, it's obviously not very cloudy, otherwise you couldn't see the sun. So what that means is you're looking to the west where it's not raining and it's not really even all that cloudy. Why is that important? Well, it turns out that the weather almost always comes from the west, part of something that we call the jet stream. This is a strong band of winds that generally sits up about where jets fly. That's how it gets its name. So several miles above the earth, but it steers weather systems. So it comes from the west. And so you're looking at tomorrow's weather. That's why it's going to be a sailor's delight because the next day is going to be a nice day. Now, if we do see a red sunrise, you have to think about where weather systems are. It turns out that if that weather system is to your east, again, sunrise, you're looking to the east, then that's where the sunny, dry weather is. And it's leaving, which means stormy weather is going to follow. And now let's think about the cows. Those cows, if they're laying down, does that really mean it's going to rain? What if, what if only half the cows are laying down? I'm not really sure exactly what that means, but it's something to think about anyway. Um, one thing that I've heard, I think it's kind of funny, if, what about if half the cows are laying down? What does that mean? Well, it, it might mean that half the cows are wrong. That's one possibility. But really what this gets to is watching your cows. Now again, this goes back to a time when many people were farmers, but you have to understand the behavior of those particular cows. So if your cows happen to lay down, then that's the prediction you would make. But maybe your cows go into the barn before it rains. Maybe they go to a particular corner of the pasture before it rains. So you kind of have to know the behavior of your cows. So really what this is talking about is paying attention to cows and, and other animals as well being observant, and that really gets to science. I mean, one of the principles of science is to be good observers, taking excellent observations. Sometimes those are measurements, sometimes those are visual uh, observations, but those are all key things in terms of getting to understand how things work, which is, I guess, essentially science. So keep track of your cows if you can, or somebody else's, and maybe you can make some weather predictions where you are. So finally, we get to the groundhog. Now, this saying, which has certainly been around for a long time, says that there'll be six more weeks of winter. So we've got a couple of things to work on. First of all, Groundhog Day itself, which I mentioned earlier, but you probably know, February 2nd is Groundhog Day. Now, if you look at this particular image, you can see it's set up as a calendar, and you can see, and you probably are familiar with the idea that spring arrives near March 21st. It can range anywhere from the 19th to the 21st, but there's the first day of spring. First day of summer, of course, June 21st. September is when we find autumn and December, the beginning of winter. But notice now the dates in between those first days of the seasons. And you'll see February 2nd on the lower left, something that's called Imbolc. That's an old name that uh, we're not entirely sure what it means. One uh, translation of it anyway is lamb's milk. It is the time of year in warmer places than here when lambs would be born. The critical thing is it's exactly halfway between the first day of winter and the first day of spring. It's the midpoint of the season and so since the seasons divide the year into quarters, these midpoints divide the year in, or divide those seasons in half. And so we call those cross-quarter days 
February 2nd, of course, you recognize as Groundhog Day. May 1st, on the upper left, that sometimes is called May Day. August 1st never was a very popular one, even in ancient times. But October 31st, I'm sure you recognize that, of course, is Halloween. So another name for Groundhog Day is Candlemas Day. And on Candlemas Day, you should have half your wood and half your hay. That's a great example of a weather saying that doesn't exactly tell you what it's telling you. In other words, in some ways, it's a pretty logical thing. You're halfway through the winter. You should have half your wood left or half of your fuel supply. The key thing here in, in terms of not saying what it meant, means to say, it doesn't mean necessarily that you have hay. Hay, of course, is food for animals, but it really means food in general. They just had to have something that rhymed. Now, here's something else about Candlemas that fits in. If Candlemas is clear and bright, come winter, take another flight. If Candlemas is gray, rain, go. Winter, come not again. The idea here is actually very, very much the groundhog saying. If Candlemas is clear, February 2nd is clear, that means sun, that means a shadow, and that means more winter is coming up. If Candlemas is gray, if Groundhog Day is cloudy, then he's not going to see a shadow and winter won't be coming again. Again, this was not a saying that was invented locally, so it doesn't necessarily work here. In fact, if you count six weeks after February 2nd, it only comes up to March 14th. And so the idea here is that our winter often extends well into April. One of the reasons that Groundhog Day has been attached to this date has to do with the groundhog itself. In places warmer than here, places like Virginia, uh, where the spring arrives a little bit earlier, February 2nd is very close to the mating season for groundhogs. Yep, they are looking for girlfriends. And so, about eight weeks later, baby woodchucks are born. Well, that would be early April. And in early April, the grass is growing quite well in places like Virginia, North Carolina, but not here. In fact, uh, we'll see probably still some patches of snow around uh, in early April. So for the groundhogs locally, their breeding season doesn't actually start until uh, the first part of March. So there's a lot of reasons for the saying not to work here. It's just such a popular saying. It's been repeated for hundreds of years. So let's look at the sky. And the sky is probably uh, one of the great places to look in terms of seeing what the weather is doing. It's the weather's happening. So there are lots of weather sayings that have to do with what you can see in the sky. And today might be a good day for that. Right now outside, it's clear out and or mostly clear, just a couple of clouds around. We'll be watching to see what kind of clouds come in, but you might see clouds that look like this. These are called mare's tails. They sort of look like a horse's tail. You might also notice, this is a good uh, time to mention, that a lot of these weather sayings rhyme. There's a reason for that, too. The rhyming makes them, well, sometimes they, they say some funny things, but also the rhyming is a memory device. It helps you to remember some of these weather sayings because if you were a sailor or even a farmer, it's not like you're carrying a book around trying to find the right weather saying. You need to kind of have these, you know, somewhat memorized, which is a little easier to do if you have these little tiny rhymes. So that's what this is. Mare's tails, mare's tails, make lofty ships carry low sails. And you see on the bottom there, that is a lofty ship, a tall, masted sailing ship. And they don't want all of their sails up if it's going to be windy before a storm. So that's really what this is telling us is there's a storm coming. Another kind of cloud that we could see, especially this afternoon, is something that looks a little bit like fish scales or cottage cheese. Of course, cottage cheese is made out of milk curds. The lumpy things in cottage cheese, that's a milk curd. And then the milk stuff is actually something we call whey. So if we think about that, you can come up with a curdly sky will not leave the ground dry. Now, again, I also mentioned they kind of look like fish scales. And we also say a mackerel sky 
which is a kind of fish. A mackerel sky will not leave us long dry. These are the kinds of clouds that come in before a storm. So we'll be looking for those sorts of clouds perhaps this afternoon. And in the forecast, there are some showers in the forecast for tonight. So we'll see if that works out. Another kind of cloud, we may or may not see that this afternoon, but it's a very thin clouds related to those same clouds. They are made out of ice crystals and they can act like the, a crystal you might hang in your kitchen window or something where you break it into the rainbow, which you, if you were to find where the rainbow is, it's not directly through the prism or crystal, it's kind of off to the side. And that's what happens as the light goes through the ice crystal, it actually goes off to the side and it creates a ring around the sun or moon. And that means rain or snow is coming soon. You'll see the hand kind of blocking the sun there. If you put your thumb over the sun and then stick your pinky out, you'll actually see, and uh, let's see if I can try this out here. We'll just stop this for a second. So um, if you actually hold out your hand, I'll step back a little bit, and put your thumb over the sun and then stick your pinky out, then you should be able to see the distance where the ring appears. And again, you have to have your arm out straight. So that's the idea with that. Now, I'll go back to my pictures here. Let's see, there they are. So a ring around the sun or moon, rain or snow, is coming soon. Another kind of thing that we could see at the end of the day today, although I think the clouds will be a little too thick for that, but you could see something called a sun dog. These are patches of light that are on either side of the sun that are part of the same idea, ice crystals with the light bending through, so that's what the sunlight does. Another name for sun dogs are also called mock suns because they kind of look like a second sun. Sometimes you'll see them on just one side of the sun. Every once in a while, you'll see them on both sides. And here's one last one in terms of clouds. It's not one that tells you what it's going to do. It depends on what's been going on. So it says, when the clouds run not together, look for a change in the weather. In other words, if the clouds up high are going in one direction and the clouds down low are going in another direction, they're kind of crisscrossing. That means the weather pattern, whatever's happening now, is changing. So if it's been raining, you'll start to see this when the sky starts to clear up. Or if it's been sunny and the clouds are starting to come in, you may see them change directions. That's again the indication the storm is getting closer. A great thing to watch and uh, you know, right through the winter, but into the, the, uh, the spring as well, birds. Birds, obviously, they're flying in the air. They're paying pretty close attention to what's going on in terms of the weather. So here's one. And their swallows are just about to return. The reason that they aren't here during the winter is basically because of their food. So let's think about that. Here's the saying, swallows fly high, clear blue skies. Swallows fly low, prepare for a blow. And you can see the swallow here is flying quite low. Do you know, does anybody know out there what swallows eat? What is their food source? You can put your answer in the chat window We'll see if we can't get a couple of people to, to come up with what swallows eat. And so uh, we, yes, Chris, somebody has a... Yeah, we have one answer as fish. And let me just check our YouTube chat also. Okay. Uh, let's see if our YouTube folks have come up with an answer. Uh, it looks like fish is the main answer that we have. Yeah, I, I often find that with this picture. I guess I'll have to find a different picture. I know the bird is flying over water, but a swallow has a very, very, very tiny beak. So they can't eat fish. They eat bugs. They eat insects. And so they fly around wherever the insects are. If, if the swallows are flying high, that's because that's where the bugs are. They're flying up high generally when the weather is nice. When the bugs are down close to the ground, of course, swallows are flying low to catch them. But bugs tend to get closer to the ground before a storm. 
And that fits in with something else you'll see a little bit later. Meanwhile, let's think about geese. Now, for us, you know, we see geese during the summer. They don't stay around during the winter because they migrate south. And they do that because of food. So imagine that you're near the ocean here, and it says geese flying out to sea, fair weather there will be. Geese staying on the shore, the weather it will pour. It's just a great saying. Again, we're not that close to the ocean, but you get the idea that the geese don't want to be flying out to sea if there's going to be a storm coming up. In fact, there have been records where different birds, including geese, have been blown off course by more than a thousand miles if they do go out to sea during a storm. So obviously not a good plan. A lot of folks have been asking about robins. Some folks have been seeing them. I actually heard them at the museum this morning. Robins basically eat worms. Now, there are a few robins that do stay around during the winter, and that's not because uh, the weather's not that much warmer. Instead, it has to do with food. Birds migrate not because of temperature, but because of food sources. So in this case, uh, the picture here showing a robin feeding one of its young, if the robins go into their nests in the middle of the day, look out for a storm. You see, robins don't attach their nests to the branches and so forth that they build them on very well. And because they don't attach them well, they sit in them to hold them in place during a storm. So that's the reasoning behind that particular saying. In the winter, of course, a lot of folks feed birds. Something, uh, just as a quick reminder, you want to be taking your bird feeders in right now because the bears are coming out of their hibernation and they will find your bird feed and you don't want that to happen. So be sure to be taking your bird feeders in. But meanwhile, you see these blue jays here feeding on some seeds that are on the ground. They feed heavy before a storm. Well, think about what would happen with, like we had the last Monday night. You have all these seeds that are out and then you get 10 inches of snow. The seeds would be buried. So they're out there finding food before it gets covered up. So insects are another great place to kind of think about weather sayings. And in particular, is one of my very, very favorites. Now, again, this is a case where the weather saying doesn't say exactly what it means. Miss Spider has hung her wash out to dry. Now, I actually heard this uh, from a woman. She lived down in East Thompson, Vermont, a little bit to our south. And she would tell me about this uh, during the summers. And what this means, well, I don't know. What does that mean? Anybody know what this would, what kind of weather this would mean? It's kind of a strange saying. And I think you can probably tell the wash is the little beads of dew that you can see on the spider web. Any ideas what kind of weather that means? Well, one thing to think about, if you're putting your wash out, would you put it out on a rainy day? <laughs> I don't think so. So in order to dry it, you want it out on a nice day. Well, it turns out that these beads of dew on a spider web are actually the sign of a nice day coming up. And there are a couple of other things that we know that are related to that. Um, in fact, this weather saying is more or less the same idea. Gossamer on the grass, rain will never pass. Now, if you look in the picture, you can see those patches of white. Those patches of white are a different kind of spider, a spider that builds its web out on the grass. And as it does so, the dew collects on it. So if there's dew in the morning, then it's not going to rain that day. I actually use this a lot when I'm doing my weather forecasting during the summer because it works so well. It sometimes works better than the computer forecasting uh, that I look at. And the idea here is that in order for dew to form, it needs to be generally a clear, calm night. Well, the sky is clear, there's not likely to be a storm nearby. And if the wind is calm, also no storm that close to us. So, if it's not stormy near us, it would take most of the day, if not all of the day, before a storm would actually produce some rain here. And so this actually works very, very well. So, uh, yes, 
Yes, Drew. Um, we just had one person asking about fogginess and what that means. <laughs> okay. And yeah, in fact, if we go back to that picture, um, you can see some fog in the background there. So fog kind of works the same way. And locally, we tend to have a lot of fog in our valleys, especially toward the second half of summer, so end of July into August, and right through about the middle of October. And it's created with those same situations. It's generally clear and the winds are light. So a foggy start to the day also generally means a sunny day will be coming up. In our valleys, sometimes it may take until 10 o'clock to see the sun, but it does turn out to be a nice day. So fog works the same way as dew. So great question. Here's one that I heard. Um, a honeybee never gets caught in the rain. Now, I thought, who better to ask that to than some beekeepers? So or actually, it was a talking, it was at a, a beekeepers meeting uh, this several years ago, and I asked the beekeepers this question. Do honeybees get caught in the rain? And they said, generally, no. And there were two things that they said about it. One, if it is raining when a honeybee is out, the raindrops are actually heavy enough that their wings are so laden down with water, they can't fly. So they don't want to be caught in the rain. This is different than a bumblebee. Bumblebees are a little larger and they actually can fly in some light rain. The other thing about honeybees that the beekeepers mentioned is that before a summer storm, suddenly, within just a few short minutes, it gets much quieter when they're tending the hives. And that's because the honeybees are going into the hive. And so instead of buzzing all around, they suddenly are going into the hive. And that's, you know, obviously accounts for the sound getting much quieter, but another clue that the honeybees are paying attention to the weather. So I had mentioned it earlier, we talked about, uh, of course, the cows, but somebody had said something about uh, raining cats and dogs. So I do have a few animal weather sayings here. Now here's another cow weather saying. I actually saw this in a book, and in the book it said this is not true. So I'll let you think about that for a second. Do you think this is true or not? I'll read it to you. If a cow endeavors to scratch her ear, you can be sure that rain is near. If she thumps her ribs with angry tail, look out for thunder, lightning, and hail. So, do you think if a cow scratches her ear, it's going to rain? It's an interesting idea. Have you ever seen a cow scratching her ear? Actually, I've had some, some people ask me that before. I guess people that haven't watched cows, um, they of course still scratch their ears on a fence post, but they can uh, actually reach up with their hind leg and scratch their ear. So, but do you think that means rain? You can use the chat uh, if you'd like to, to maybe, all you have to do is say yes or no. Um, you think it's true or not. And maybe you can think about this. If the cows are scratching their ear or swishing their tail, is that an unusual thing? Do cows almost never scratch their ears or do they do it kind of almost all the time? Yes, Drew, we have somebody that's uh, yeah, responded, yeah? We have a couple responses, both are yes. <laughs> okay, so, so the, you do think this is true. Well, I agree with you, I do think it's true. And it's not because that there's something magical about cows scratching their ear. It has to do with, well, a couple of things. One, why is the cow scratching its ear? And I think some of you probably know, probably bugs. Well, they itch, obviously, but the bugs would be part of that, swishing their tail. There would be bugs around. Yes, Drew. Yeah. One person is wondering if that, I, I'm assuming they mean the tail action of the cow, if that is like a way that the cows release chemicals as well. I know you were just describing what they're actually doing. Ah, there's an interesting question. I, I don't know that they release many chemicals when they do that. But they certainly uh, do you know, keep the bugs away from themselves by, by doing that. And you know, part of the idea here is that 
if there are cows scratching their ears and swishing their tails, and that's a normal thing, then we're coming back to observation, watching your cows. It turns out that if you know your cows, you would notice if they're doing it a lot more than usual. And that's kind of the key thing here. If they're doing it a lot more than usual, it means there are more bugs. So I'm gonna get you to remember, if you think back to the swallows that we mentioned very early, those swallows are eating bugs. And where were the bugs before a storm? Down close to the ground. And that's why they're bug bugging the cows more, because there's more bugs around. Also, you may notice that yourself. Sometimes in the summer, all of a sudden, bugs just seem to be really pestering. And it may be because there's a storm coming up. Now, some of you may have a cat or a dog. And so here's a, a dog weather saying, if dogs eat grass, rain follows. I'm not sure about you, but that's not what uh, I experienced when I had a dog growing up as a kid. When my dog ate grass, there was usually a mess that followed that I had to clean up. But this is a saying that's in an old weather book. Um, and then, of course, maybe you don't have a dog, maybe you have a cat. So here's one of my favorite cat weather sayings. There are more of them. If a cat washes behind its ear, it's a sign of a storm. Yes, Drew. Sorry, just finding my unmute button. Uh, you actually have two questions. Um, one is, do cats eat grass? And the other is, what happens to bugs when they get stuck in the rain? <laughs> well, let's see. All right, so the first one, I do believe cats eat grass. Um, and I'm not really sure what that means in terms of weather. And what happens when a dog gets caught in the rain? They get soaking wet. <laughs> Oh, I think they're also asking what happens to bugs or insects in the rain. Ah, well, of course, if you're a little tiny bug and it's pouring rain, you're going to get knocked down to the ground. So I think bugs don't want to actually be there uh, when there is a, a storm hanging around. So that's one of the things. It certainly would wash out the bugs. Um, one of the things about both of the, the dog and the cat weather saying here, is not to take them too literally. In other words, it doesn't mean exactly that if a cat washes behind its ear, it's gonna rain. What it means is you need to pay attention to your cat or your dog. I'll give you an example. When I was a kid, I knew there was a thunderstorm coming because at night sometimes, my bed would start shaking. Now, the reason my bed was shaking is because my very large dog was trying to get underneath my bed. He could hear the thunder before I could. And so my dog was my clue that there was a thunderstorm coming, even if I didn't hear it yet. And so that's the kind of thing you can watch your cat, watch your dog, and see how their behavior changes as the weather changes. And you might, depending on your cat and dog, you might be able to get a clue about the weather is going to do. Plants are another place where we can kind of check the weather, see what's going on. Of course, this time of year, not a lot of plant activity. So just keep these things in mind as we head into the warmer weather. This is one of the first weather sayings I remember before I even knew that it was a weather saying. It was just something that a friend of ours always said. You can see the underside of the leaves before a storm, which I always thought was kind of silly because if you stand underneath the tree, of course you can see the underside of the leaves but that's not what it means. It means that if the wind is blowing from the south, it tends to flip the leaves up so you can see the underside of them. And leaves are essentially solar collectors. They collect sunlight, so they're angled toward the south. The sun, even here in the summertime, isn't always, or it isn't above head, our heads, it's always somewhere in the south. So, Leaves grow angled toward the south, so the south wind will actually flip the leaf up, and that's why you can see the underside of the leaves. Something to think about, we are heading into spring after all, and it'll probably be uh, another six weeks or so, or maybe even eight weeks before we see the leaves really come out, but here's one to think about. If the ash comes out before the oak, the summer will be a soak. If the oak comes out before the ash, 
the summer will be a splash. Now, if you think about that, what would be the difference between a soak and a splash? Well, some people try to actually figure out some deep meaning behind that. It's actually a weather joke. This is a weather saying from England. And in England, it just rains. It rains almost every day during the summer. So much so, there's a saying from a little town called Devon in England. And in Devon, it rains eight days out of seven. Yes, Drew. So we just have one student asking, what is an ash? Ah, the ash is the ash tree. We actually have a fair number of ash trees in our area. Um, the ash tree right now, we're being uh, very careful about looking for something called the ash emerald borer or the emerald ash borer. This is a bug that is actually uh, killing some of the ash trees. And so we're watching and uh, uh, foresters in particular trying to keep that under control. Uh, we don't have as many oak trees locally. Um, as, as you head south of the, this area, though, there are more oak trees. We do have a, a smoke trees right at the museum. So there are some oak trees around. They tend to be on south facing slopes that are a little bit warmer. Now we'll think about the wind because obviously that's the air that's moving and that gives us the you know changes in our weather. So this is one for those of you that like to go fishing. When the wind is from the north, the skill for fishermen goes not forth. When the wind is from the east, the fishing is the least. When the wind is from the south, it blows flies in the fish's mouth. But when the wind is from the west, that's when the fishing is the best. Now, the idea here is that the wind indicating basically the kind of temperatures that we have coming in. A north wind is a cold wind, and not as many bugs are going to be out. You notice that when the wind is from the south, it blows flies in the fish's mouth. That's one of their food sources. And so, uh, obviously, if nature is providing the food, they're not as interested if you're doing some fishing and trying to catch a fish that way. Now, you can use the same idea, those same different wind directions, and this is perfect this time of year. When the wind is from the north, the sap flows forth. When the wind is from the east, the sap flows least. When the wind is from the south, the sap flows drought. But when the wind is from the west, then sugaring is the best. Now, one, uh, there are a couple of things in here. First of all, uh, you probably heard a word drought in there. When the wind is from the south, the sap flows drought. Drought, you won't probably find in the dictionary. It's a very old word, but it means dry. What it means is that when the wind is from the south, the sap does tend to flow. Now, this isn't true for every sugar bush. It isn't true for every maple tree. But... It is something that is common, and so common that obviously they put it into a weather saying. For reasons that we don't understand, if the temperatures are perfect, say 25 degrees at night and warming up to 40 or 45 during the daytime, generally that will produce some good sugar. But if the wind's from the south, somehow the tree knows not to send its sap up and down in the tree. And one of the reasons may be a south wind would raise the temperatures up because it's coming from the south. Then when the wind switches back to the north, too much sap would have gone up into the tree. The tree doesn't want its uh, buds to swell just yet. And so somehow the tree seems to know, and they're still studying this actually at the Maple Research Center over in uh, uh, Underhill, over in uh, the other side of the state. UVM has a research project over there at the Proctor Maple Center. So. This is something that we still don't understand, and it doesn't apply to every sugar bush. Some sugar bushes run just fine with the south wind. Today's an example. It froze up last night. It will be in the 40s this afternoon. If you've got some trees that are attached pretty far or maybe uh, you know nearby, maybe you can find out, is the sap flowing today? Here's one that I've never seen written down, but I've heard it from a few people that I know, So, um, and I find it works quite well. If the snow blows off the trees, the next storm will be snow. If the snow melts off the trees, the next storm will be rain. And that does seem to make sense because the idea is if the weather is turning cold behind the storm, the snow will blow off the trees, there'll be cold air in place, the next storm will tend to be 
a cold storm, so snow. But if it's melting off the trees, that means there's warm air behind the storm. And if there's warm air around, that's why the next storm would be rain. And finally, one of the things, and you'll notice the, the weather, of course, goes in cycles, sometimes very short cycles, sometimes longer cycles. Here's a short cycle. I think many people have heard this before. Rain or snow before 7, done by 11. I use this very often when I'm doing my forecasting, and this goes back in part to the museum's weather records, which go back 125 years. I know from looking at those records, rain most of the time doesn't last more than about four to five hours. There are certainly storms that last all day long, but most of them are much shorter than that. So if it's already raining before seven, then four hours later, 11 o'clock, most of it, if not all of it, has moved by. And so this tends to work most of the time. Here's another one. If the snow starts at midday, a foot of it will lay. That probably works in warmer places than here. Up here, it doesn't seem to matter when the snow starts, we can get a foot of snow. But in warm places where it's, let's say, New Jersey or Virginia or something like that, that would be unusual for it to snow in the middle of the day. And that means it's cold, and that would mean that there's a pretty you know, significant storm happening. Yes, Drew. Yeah. So we have one question that I have a feeling might require some explaining. Um, okay. but one student is asking, why does the winter sometimes last longer than other winters? Well, there are just different weather patterns. In fact, you probably find that if the winter ends here early, it's probably lasting longer someplace else. A good example is this year where our winter, which was fairly mild, has, other than the snow from the other day, you know, which obviously makes it seem like winter's extending itself, but our winter really was uh, on the mild side, and so it seems like spring's coming a little earlier. That's not the case out in the western United States, where they've had a series of some snowstorms. In fact, the, just the other day, I think they had one or two feet of snow in the Sierra Nevada. So the idea is that the weather pattern varies from year to year and from place to place. So there's no particular pattern that uh, changes when we're going to see you know, spring arrive. Just as a good example, last year, we ended up with snow into the middle of April. It was the longest period of snow continuously on the ground on the museum's weather records. Um, I do see on my screen that my battery's running low, so I'm going to have to just take uh, two-minute pause and plug my uh, computer in here. So while Mark's doing that, I just want to remind everybody, since we have about 10 minutes left in class, this is the time to get your questions in. If you're in Zoom, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A tab. That's probably the best place to ask a question. You can also ask them anonymously in there. And as you've heard, Mark has answered a number of those questions today. You can also look at the chat button. Um, we have some chats already going in there, of course, answering some of the questions that Mark has posed for you today. And if you want to share your screen and be a part of our video, you can raise your hand, which is another button down at the bottom there, and you'll be able to share your audio and your video. Um, and of course, if you're on YouTube and you're watching on there today, you can chat with us on the chat that's probably on the upper right next to the, where the video of Mark talking is or myself talking is, and we'll do our best to answer your questions as well. So thank you again. Okay, and I'm back and my computer's happy and plugged in, so. <laughs> All right, so we were talking about time cycles, things, you know, sometimes short, sometimes longer. So here's another great one. Um, this works very well, especially in the summer again. A sunny shower won't last an hour, which really makes sense if you think about it. If it's sunny, it's obviously not raining every place. So any shower that's coming by is probably very slow. It's moving along, and that's why it won't last very long. Now, this one often confuses people. Morning mountains, afternoon fountains. 
Now, first of all, it has nothing to do with the mountains that are in this picture. The mountains aren't the mountains. I could actually take a picture of a very flat Kansas wheat field. This would still be true because the mountains are the clouds. In other words, if the clouds look like mountains, if they're growing very tall, the afternoon fountains are, of course, rain that would be happening. So if the clouds are growing tall in the morning, that you could kind of get the idea that the afternoon, you may have a rain shower. And of course, April showers bring Mayflowers. What do Mayflowers bring? Okay, that's a question. Can anybody know? Does anybody know what a Mayflower brings? One person. Well, maybe this is a, a too old a joke. I don't know. <laughs> One person on um, on YouTube said maybe um, a what did they say a, a, a um, sun sunny day, and then on Zoom we have one person saying an April shower. Ah, okay. Well, it turns out that Mayflowers bring pilgrims. That's a history thing. The Mayflower, that's the ship that the Pilgrims came over uh, to New England way back in, uh, was 1632 it was. So anyway, 1642. Okay. So, um, and then we'll finish up with some weather signs about the winter because if there is sort of a, a collection of weather sayings, there's a whole bunch of them that specifically have to do with winter. So part of the theme is that nature is prepared. So here's one, onion skins thin, easy winter coming in, onion skins tough, the winter. The onion skins, of course, protect the onion. So why is the onion need protecting? We pick them. Well, it turns out that if you did pick them, onions are actually a two-year plant. So in the second year, and sometimes this happens if I forget to pick uh, one of my onions, it'll send up a seed stalk in the second year. And so it does protect the onion against the cold weather so it can produce seed stalk to produce more onions. So it is an active measure. Now this one, again, doesn't quite say what it means. If the old man is wearing a heavy overcoat, the winter will be hard. Now this is a Russian proverb, and the key thing here, obviously you've got some corn that you can see. Apparently, in Russian, the word for old man and corn are almost identical. So in other words, if the corn is wearing a heavy overcorn, if the corn has a heavy husk on it during the summer, the winter will be cold. Again, the corn husk protecting the corn. Now, most of us don't uh, collect beaver pelts anymore, but this is an old saying that if the beaver fur is very thick, the winter will be very cold. Again, this, the, the theme here is that nature is being prepared. And so, thinking of that, if a squirrel gathers up lots of nuts, it's gonna be a cold, snowy winter. Now, if you think about squirrels, I mean, squirrels are nice and so forth, but I don't think they're exactly that smart. I mean, you wouldn't imagine them running your computer, for example. So, what's the deal with squirrels and nuts? Well, it turns out if you think about, a, if you were a squirrel, what would you do? You see that? You pick it up. So it's not the squirrel, it's the nuts. And so there is a nut weather saying, a good nut year is a good snow year. Again, with the theme of nature being prepared, nature would be producing more food to help out for a long, cold winter. And that's true with apples as well. A good apple year is a good snow year. You have to be kind of careful with the apples in terms of them being a good predictor because apple trees, just as a general average, tend to bear heavy the other year. Oh, we saw those geese before, but here's a different weather saying about geese. If geese fly south early, the winter will be early. Now, of course, 
what exactly would be early as opposed to late for geese. Um, anybody have an idea what, if you could pick a date, when would the average date of geese flying south be? Any idea, any guesses about when geese would be flying south for the winter? And feel free to write in the chat window if you have any guesses. Yeah, well, as you're thinking about that, I mean, of course, they're flying south because wherever they're coming from, things are freezing up and they don't have food, so that's part of it. Also, a good note about this, there are migratory geese, but there are also geese that live locally. They sometimes move down toward the coast where it doesn't freeze during the winter, but we don't have just migratory geese here. Some of our geese actually hang around as close as they can throughout the winter. So the average date locally happens to be Columbus Day, more or less. So in other words, which is or, you know, the, about October 10th or so. So if you see geese flying south in late September and early October, that would be early. If you don't see very many geese until the end of October, that would be late, and of course, maybe the winter would be arriving late. Now, if you look in this picture, it's a little harder to see, but down in the bottom center, you can see a gray wasp hive. If wasps build their hives high above the ground, look for deep snow. If they build them near the ground, it means a mild winter with less snow. This one obviously very close to the ground. The key thing here, though, is that it is not a home for wasps in the winter. It turns out that's not why this is built. Uh, this is for them based in the summer. The only wasp that survives from one year to the next is the queen wasp. And she doesn't stay here. She goes into a nearby wetlands or someplace, somewhere she can get down underneath into the mud where it doesn't freeze, and then she comes back out in the spring. Now, that doesn't mean there won't be wasps inside it. Uh, a wasp, on the average, only lives three or four months. But... If you were to find one in the winter and bring it inside, some of the wasps actually kind of freeze, some of those that were born late, and they could actually wake up. So not a good idea to bring one inside during the winter. Woolly bear caterpillars? I just simply say not. There are too many variations, and there's no particular weather connection, even though uh, there's a very popular idea of looking at the woolly bear to figure out the winter forecast. And finally, just a couple of weather cycles here. And this is something that probably doesn't work quite as well, but they're also not very exact. So many frosts in the fall, so many snows in the winter. I guess there is a clue that maybe if it's a cold fall, we'll have a snowy winter, but that actually doesn't seem to be true on our weather records at the museum. This one works pretty well, it's a longer cycle. Six weeks after it snows on the mountains, it will snow in the valleys. And that's about the right timing. If we see snow on top of either Birch Mountain or Mount Moosla, uh, if you can see some of the White Mountains, about six weeks later, you'll have snow down in the valleys. Now, this is a strange one, and maybe you'll want to jot this down because you'll have to wait till fall to try it out. If you pick a carrot on the first hard killing frost and hang it outside by its greens, when the carrot falls off the greens, fall. Now, this is a strange idea. I heard it many, many years ago. But if you think of it this way, if you tear it out, eventually it's going to rot. And apparently it takes about six weeks for it to rot and fall off the greens. And so it's not a carrot you're going to want to eat, but it is something that at least might be something fun to try in terms of figuring out when it's going to snow. And we'll finish with this. This is one of my favorites. If ice in November will bear a duck, nothing comes after but sleet and muck, which really means if it's cold in November to start, then the rest of the winter will be mild. Well, this year, this past November, was a cold November, one of the earliest uh, starts of the winter, but it obviously turned fairly mild for the rest of it. So apparently the duck was right this year. True, yes, you have something. 
Yeah, so just one last question as we wrap up class. Um, and this is, I, I don't think, related to what you're talking about now, but it was asked uh, about 10 minutes ago. And one student mm -hmm. was wondering, why are news reporters, and he may mean meteorologists, sometimes wrong about the weather? Oh, well, I was wrong just the other day. So, <laughs> so, so thinking about that, uh, predicting the weather is not something that's exact. We do a lot of science. There are a lot of things that we don't know about what's happening. So just using uh, Monday night as an example, we had to forecast two to four inches of snow with up to six inches in New Hampshire. And we ended up with about eight to 10 inches of snow. I can tell you now what happened. And a lot of it had to do with the idea that the storm was over the ocean. And we don't always get uh, good information from the ocean. So Sometimes we end up not being able to, you know, get the information to get into, uh, say, a computer forecast, for example. And so without the information, we can't make an accurate forecast. And that's still happening. It happens less than it used to, but um, there are just so many different things that can happen to change the weather. Sometimes we're going to. Mark, I, I think we may have lost you, but um, we did hear the answer to your last question, and we just wanted to, to say thank you for that answer. Um, and uh, I just wanted to wrap up our class today, because I know Mark was just finishing. So I wanted to thank everybody who was able to join us for today's session. Um, we're extremely grateful to have you on here in Zoom asking your great questions. We're also happy to have you on YouTube on the live stream asking questions. And for those of you who might join us later on Kingdom Access Television, we're grateful to have you tuning in as well. Um, just a small reminder, we'll be continuing to expand our online program from the programming from the Fairbanks Museum next week. And you can check under learning on our website on the front page, there's a tab for virtual learning and we'll have a new schedule up there pretty soon. So thank you again, everybody, for tuning in, and we look forward to having you join us for a class again soon.